You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take. Plan. I'm the enemy. Because I like to think. Она отказала мне, сказала, что любит тебя. Думай, что любит тебя! Да она не может любить меня! Да я люблю тебя! But we only just met. All I want is you. I just want us to be together. Šere hlavně pražáky, jmenuje se Jožin. Jožin s pážin, močálem se plíží. Jožin s pážin, k vesnici se plíží. Jožin s pážin. Everyone, <laughs> oh, I've never looked so skinny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it started out a little rough there, Russ, but we made up, and in the end, we were just happy singing together. Yeah. What a great day that was! What a great day! So I got people rushing backwards and forwards. It's like an ER here. Oh, it sounds like uh, our house. We're just hustling and bustling all over yeah. the place moving things <laughs> around got lady fulton moved in here so we're sharing an office these days and we're kind of scheduling you know who can do work away from the office while the other one is in here for me doing a show i just realized i'm off camera let's fix that yay uh, you know, and then when she's got to do phone calls and whatnot, then I hit the bricks and try and do work elsewhere. So we're making it work. The kids are going to get their own rooms. We're just, you know, in the process of moving 20 years of accumulated stuff. <laughs> I know all I, about that. <laughs> I feel like we're moving, but we're not actually changing locations. It's very surreal. Hmm. Uh, so <clears throat> anyway, another busy week, lots going on, um, lots going on in the comics world. Yeah. And, uh, besides you and I both being extremely busy with comics work, Russ, I was, I was listening to a show, I think it was a few days ago, um, and, uh, the name Jose Luis Garcia Lopez came up. I was very happy about that. Yes. So I thought that, you know, before things got really crazy with the holidays and I had to take a couple weeks off, um, we did a show spotlighting George Perez, mm -hmm. um, the influence that he's had on the comic book industry, the influence he's had on um, me personally and the, the visual aesthetics um, of the Outliers universe. Yeah, And uh, it turns out that he was just one of several, and I had planned on doing essentially a series of shows spotlighting mm. different creators and talking about how they've influenced comics and uh, how they've influenced the Outlier universe in particular. Oh, that's cool. And so uh, when I heard Jose's name pop up, I thought, well, now I know who uh, number two on the list is. Let's do a show spotlighting mm -hmm. Jose. Uh, but before right. we get too far into the details, I want to welcome everyone to the show. Um, Leg Kick One was here first. Uh, welcome. Comic Talk with Pops Van Zant. 
Thank you, uh, Pops, for encouraging everyone to subscribe to the channel. There was I was having a little bit of a problem with StreamYards momentarily. I hope it's done and over with for the rest of the show. Uh, I was able to respond to Leg Kick, but not to Pops. And then later, Pops' name popped wow. up. Oh. Pops popped up. Um, good morning, Genuine Comics. Dave Brink. Uh, hope things are well over in your neck of the woods. Uh, Adam Miller, good morning, sir. Welcome. Uh, Pedro Ng, our buddy in the jungles of Panama. Hope you're doing well, Pedro. I'm sure it's nice and warm and humid mm, uh, warm. when it's uh, you know crisp and uh, sometimes frigid for the rest of us in the world oh, here in oh. January. And uh, Statistical Zero, good morning, Stato. Or afternoon, I should say, uh, for you, my friend. So thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever the case may be, wherever you are. Uh, Russ. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm just increasing the wattage on my TENS machine. Sorry. Oh, no worries. I've got an injury in my leg, and I just... I've been sitting there while I've been drawing, and I've been uh, having the tens machine on it. You've been at um, so much butt kicking this last week that you're requiring <laughs> medical treatment. Is that what I'm? That's hearing? the one. Yeah, I've kicked so many people's butts that I know I need a tens machine. <laughs> you were saying? Sorry, go on. Sounds like you could do with a bit of that old Panamanian winter. Pedro says it's warm and breezy, but not that humid this time of year. It's beach weather. Oh, that sounds bet, lovely. That feel nice on the old leg. Yeah, yeah, warm legs. Mm. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, um, so uh, when you and I were growing up, the 70s, the 80s, there was comic book uh, and superhero merchandise basically everywhere. Yeah. Uh, we had... Um, underoos, uh, for anybody in the audience who doesn't know what those are, it's basically like underwear, uh, with superhero print all over them. Um, pajamas, du they had duvet covers, pillowcases, wallpaper. It, yeah, we had wallpaper, we had uh, bed sheets, like. Russ said pillowcases. I mean, I had at one time I had a complete set of Superman bed sheets, pillowcase. Uh, my grandfather had uh, built me a wooden toy chest, and my mom took Superman wallpaper and lined the chest with it. Oh, that sounds fantastic. It was fantastic. And for a young whippersnapper, who loves superheroes, every time I opened the toy chest, I saw Superman there. Uh -huh. it, it was incredible. And so in 1982, DC decided to uh, put together a style guide, a comprehensive style guide, so that all artists working for the publisher and all licensees who were licensing DC Comics properties would have a consistent, essentially, set of guidelines from which they could use for their advertising, for their merchandising. And they essentially put forth um, this set of brand images, I guess you could say. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, that was the first comprehensive style guide that had been done uh, for this purpose. Um, I tried looking for one for Marvel. I know they had internal guidelines, but I've never been able to find a a printed, uh, internally published comprehensive guide that early uh, for Marvel. So if anybody knows of anything, please uh, clue me in. I'd love to find it. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. With um, with. DC, uh, they put one together, and I'm going to bring it up here on the screen. Uh, and the guy they got to draw it was named Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, uh, a Spanish-born 
uh, Argentine artist who had been working in the mid to late 70s for DC, uh, as well as doing other stuff. And the, um, the style guide here uh, was basically a three ring binder with a bunch of uh, color sheets that you had the DC color palette um, that all the, the licensees, if they were going to use line art and then color it differently, they had to stick to this color palette. Uh, you had uh, turnarounds of all the characters. And so when I had my Superman uh, wallpaper in my toy chest or my Superman bed sheets or my Batman underoos, it was all artwork and color schemes taken from this guide. Sorry. And it, it's one of those things where it occurred to me that even though um, Garcia Lopez doesn't have in his career a, uh, a era-defining run like a nightfall, let's say, would have been an era-defining run for Batman in the 90s, right? Mm. Um, or Crisis on Infinite Earths, a lot of people think defined DC in the 80s, you know, something like that. So Lopez doesn't have that in his um, portfolio that I've been able to find. It's a lot of um, one issue here, a couple issues there. Uh, he did a five-issue Real short run on the New Teen Titans in 85. Um, it's almost like he has the track record of a fill-in artist if you just go by the books that he drew. Or a journeyman. Uh, a journeyman, yeah. And there's yeah. absolutely nothing wrong with that. I you know, I don't say that disparagingly at all. I think a lot of... Uh, tons... No, I, I, would love, I would have loved to have done that. That, that would I think have really suited me, I have to say. Yeah. A lot of times as readers, especially longtime readers, I think we focus in on, you know, the so-called stars uh, of the industry because, um, you know, most of us like a, a lot of similar stuff if we're into superhero comics. And uh, so the big, the biggest names we tend to key in on, but there's a lot of um, writers, artists, colorists, letters, you name it, Every everyone in the production process. Who are putting out good work month in month out um but it's not um uh, let's say five years on the same book and so we as you know readers don't get to know them really or uh, as far as through their work um, so anyway i was just thinking how garcia lopez you know when you look at his track record of published books um it comes across as uh, like you said russ uh very much like a journeyman but he had an incredible impact on the industry and this style guide it not only um kind of unified the look of dc comics in the early 80s uh right before they got really really big and dc had uh almost gone completely out of business in the late 70s um Warner Brothers buying them, that was, it was an act of desperation to sell to Warner Brothers. It was basically, from what I understand, um, to prevent the company from dissolving. Um, so it, as much as we, at times, uh, may or may not be happy with what Warner Brothers has done with DC Comics, uh, that was the reason why uh, they were sold to the WB. It was to prevent them from disappearing entirely. Uh, and so they went through this real down period in the late 70s. And then in the early 80s, you had um, the new Teen Titans uh, relaunching or launching. Uh, it was a rebooted brand uh, in 1980. You had the style guide in 1982. Uh, there's a couple of other things that were happening in the early 80s. Uh, but all of that together kind of set up DC for massive success in the mid 80s uh, with things like Dark Knight Returns, The Watchmen, uh, Infinite Crisis on Infinite Earths. Um, and this style guide was 
behind all of that kind of unifying um, the look of the DC universe. So if you were a new artist coming in uh, and you were going to be, let's say you were a fill-in artist and you were going to draw an action comics or you were going to draw um, Batman, whatever it was, uh, the Justice League, uh, you would be given, your reference material would come from this guide. And it struck me that Garcia Lopez really had a world-building influence on the DC universe, despite not having, you know, a big uh, famous run of comics. There was no um, Death of Superman, let's say, that he would have drawn like a Dan Jurgens. There was no um, Nightfall that he, he would have drawn, um, you know, like Graham Nolan. But uh, his work here had an enormous impact on everybody that was drawing these characters. You've, you've got to say that he's he's effectively ever present in the 80s and early yeah. 90s because of the fact that you can't help but be uh, swayed, uh, impressed, um in some way um what's the word for it uh influenced uh, inspired and influenced mm -hmm. by these uh fantastic uh turnarounds and style guides because you know this this isn't they're a work of art on their own yeah i mean they're beautifully put together the, Absolutely. the artwork is fantastic um, so if if you were if you were already there and doing your thing, you'd be impressed by one of your colleagues doing this. And if you were a new artist on the way in, it would probably have some effect, I would suggest, on the way that you drew and the way that you put things together. Yeah, I mean, we so that would sorry, sorry to finish the point. Yeah, so that ahead. would like spiral out. That would like web out into the rest of the industry, certainly into the rest of DC publishing. Yeah, well, I mean, I've lost count of how many artists now I've either heard uh, or read talking about the influence that Garcia Lopez had on them personally. Uh, some of them were already established artists, and they saw um, Lopez's work and just thought, wow, I've got to step up my skill level here. Uh, what I was doing before just isn't cutting it next to his work. And then... Um, there was also new artists coming in who were just blown away by what they were seeing mm. uh, in advertising material, Russ, like price tags that would have a flying Superman illustration on them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Everything. You know, it, <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, you had lawn sprinklers um, mm. that were, you know, in the shape of Superman. It was nuts. So, um he's one of those guys that um from everything i've never been able to meet him personally uh from everything i've been able to read uh, or hear about him uh he's just a stand-up guy uh he does a lot of convent i mean i should say did a lot of conventions i can't imagine he's done many in the last couple of years with all the pandemic lockdowns no but, um yeah, there's tons of pictures of him interacting with fans online at different conventions. All, all the, by all accounts, he's he's a stand-up guy, a real nice guy. Um, and one of those pros that you know has been around for decades, and um, other pros want to uh, emulate uh, in in some ways, um, incorporate elements of of Lopez's style into their own work. And I know that a lot of people who I've talked with who like his art as much as I have throughout my life have talked about how clean uh, it is, um, you know, how readable, instantly readable. Mm. And some people uh, I know in more recent years, I think it started in the 90s, um, when visual styles changed quite a bit, hmm. it's, it's continued since and talking about how, um, how great eighties comics were and, and in a lot of cases still are, but thinking that you can't, 
draw that way anymore for some bizarre reason. <laughs> um, I, the only reason I've heard for it is that it's outdated. I don't know, uh, Russ, what do you think about that? I, I think it's outdated if you want... Um... <laughs> Some of the co a lot of the comics that are produced currently aren't all ages. They're most definitely adult. Mm -hmm. They have adult material in them and adult themes. And as such, adults, a lot of them who grew up with these comics when they were younger, went through the 90s and are looking at these styles in a slightly different way and maybe see this kind of style as almost childish. Mm. Um, be simply because... It relates to them being ch children. It relates to them as they were younger, mm -hmm. um, and the '90s style had, because it was it was a bit grittier. A lot of the styles that came out then, uh, not necessarily really grittier, just they had a look, yeah. um, and and that's just continued. And so, even those people that are coming into the to the uh, comics industry now, or, or, or fans that are picking up comics now. It's almost like, well, that's the way it's done, isn't it? Um, and uh, I, I don't think that that's the case. I think you can go back and, and well, I, I have, you have, you can go back and say, no, the reason the 80s comics were so great <laughs> was because they were to the point in a lot of cases. They mm -hmm. were about telling stories and um, I think there's been a, a, a few bits and pieces in the last week or so about artists rights and all that kind of stuff and some people yeah. saying well be quicker and that's very unfair when you consider the standard of the artwork on some of the comics at the moment such some comics have yeah. amazing art in them and must take a long time to do i base my stylings i base the things that i love on comics that were produced as pulp they were produced as throwaway items, as in, you want to get the next story, you want to get the next story. This was before there was any kind of collector's uh, market. People yeah. were interested in the story and the story only. They were making millions of these things every month. every month. And people, the artists that I admire most, and that would probably be in, including Lopez, would simply turn this stuff out at a very fast pace. The more pages mm -hmm. they did, the more money they got paid. It was a very simple process. Um, and if you look, for instance, I, I have artwork up around me right now. Uh, if if you look at this kind of artwork, um, it's got power, it's got style, it's got dynamism, it's got weight. Uh, and the most important thing of all, it tells a story. Yeah. And um, and And it's done at speed. Um, with the story it, uh, uppermost in its mind. It's not about... The, the, the fact that these these people that we look up to um, made art that is fantastic art was, mm -hmm. was that was a side thing. That was that was that was a, a very happy result of them telling stories. Yeah. And and uh, so it, even that does affect the way that you draw because I I'm I'm now drawing stuff that I look at the benchmark of the people that I respect and love as far mm -hmm. as their art is concerned. And and I don't feel I can ever reach that. So I'm I'm kind of not focusing on the story like they were, even though I am, I'm yeah. it's still it's not the same environment anymore. Um, but I think there's a real argument to say, no, that's not true. You can't just say, well, it's not done like that anymore. You can make it happen like that. Um and uh, the, uh, the, I, th I think the most obvious way to do that is to take the style that worked so well back then, which was true all ages comic books, mm -hmm. and apply it to an all ages comic book now and sell it to all ages rather than it be too dark, too gritty. There, there's places for this kind of artwork, mm -hmm. um, but my personal love is all ages comics. And yeah. I've been very fortunate to be involved in some mainstream all ages comics and still am. And that's where I think that's where I think we can that's where I think we can turn around comic books in general is just by maybe seeing the way comics used to be made and the audiences that they used to attract and focus on storytelling and, and not on making 
a statement, whether that be political or ideological, or the best piece of art that you can possibly find, because that's going to take mm -hmm. you days and days to do, and you're never going to get paid properly for it. Let's just focus on the stories, make great stories. Yeah. When obviously there still has to be a standard. You still have to produce good work, but that doesn't mean that it has to be the most detailed or the most photorealistic. What's important to, to every writer and to every artist, to every sequential artist should be story above all else. Well, and this style guide that DC put together and hired Lopez to draw, it really helped artists do that from what I've been yeah, able yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to dig up. Um, you know, because well, if, well, sorry, if, sorry, it's just interesting. Yeah, go ahead. The, 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 the pieces that you were showing of, of, of the style guide, they, mm -hmm. they were so obvious. Do you know what I mean? It was like, and that's why I was saying that they would inspire new artists coming in to, to work in a certain way because they were so damn good. Yeah. And they, and they were so easy to follow. I mean, if you can't follow that, you, you know, you're in trouble because it's so well put together. And such a such a, a a benchmark for artists to look at that and go, well, I've got to make my characters look that good while they're in a story. Yeah, um, I was trying to get a grid layout here. There we go. Go this. Go. Yeah. So something like this, where. Um, you know, there you've got the Justice League of America, let's say. And when you, I would imagine that if you were an artist newly hired by DC and you know they've got a house style, which this, you know, was like the first big attempt that I know of to formally declare to the world, this is the DC how mm. style mm. you know but let's say in the 70s you had uh you know neil adams you could arguably say kind of develop the dc house style there was a, mm. a lot of artists of the day who would say they looked up to adams and you know his clean uh lines his storytelling uh abilities and whatnot um so there you have you know people looking up to an artist um who who did produce let's say i was you know, long runs where it, w it was Batman or a Green Lantern or whatever. Um, the guy did a lot of work where he was able to spend time with a particular character or spend time on a particular title uh, and naturally had a lot of influence. Um, but if you were a new artist and, you you know, let's say you're hired to do a, a fill-in issue or maybe um, a mini series, uh, let's say you've got a portfolio Maybe you're not new to drawing, but you are new to DC uh, and you've got a new miniseries you have to draw, then I would imagine the last thing you want to do is look like you've never drawn a DC character exactly. before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, stuff like this would be a lifesaver. If you have to come yeah. in and, and do a fill-in on the Justice League, I, I think you would want to be looking at stuff like this. Hmm. Um, well, I, I've done. I've now done... I've now been involved with three um, branded pieces and all of them came with style guides. Mm -hmm. um, the the one I'm working on at the moment is very loose. Uh, the Doctor Who one was not as loose. It, it, it was more about colours and, um, and clothing. Uh, but the, um, the Ben 10 style guide was explicit. I mean, you could only draw things in a certain way, yeah. Um, and and I had to work my way through that. So actually, when I was doing the Ben Ten stuff, I came at it more from from it more like a, a lot of my uh, design briefs from when I was an art director. Mm -hmm. It was it was very much that way involved. So I, I, and that was more about the finishing of the artwork and the way all the characters looked and that kind of stuff. So I could I could lay down my my comic strip. I could lay down my sequential art and get the story out. And then think about right they've really got to look a certain way and i, I tried mm. my hardest to make it look like effectively a, a show in every every uh issue um so it it can be restrictive it can feel restrictive having mm -hmm. a, a style guide but at the same time it does take pressure off certain aspects of what you're doing 
So it, it's always a balancing act in, in the style guide as to how much of it is, is actually helping you and how much of it is restricting you. Uh, what has it been like helping to develop a style guide? Because uh, I'm showing right now uh, some mm. turnarounds that you did for the Saint yeah. that, that when we were in pre-production, uh, oh, Antoine is asking <laughs> what's a bent in. That would be Ben 10. Oh, no. Ben 10. <laughs> yeah, B-E-N and then the number 10. Ben, ben, uh, ben 10. It was on the uh, Cartoon Network. So. Yeah, animated show. I they did, had uh, a comic book adaptation that Russ drew. I was... I, did the the reboot stuff so i think they're on their like third or fourth series now but uh, they don't do that magazine in the uk anymore because uh, they couldn't get young boys to read it <laughs> oh interesting mm. interesting mm. It's, it's, I, I, it, a lot of that is to do with the fact that it's we don't have um news agents anymore Mm. So w when I was a kid, we had news agents, and there would be a whole stack of comics in there. Yeah, uh, and that would be where you get your sweets and your cigarettes, and um, I wouldn't get cigarettes, but sweets and cigarettes and uh, and comic books and newspapers and magazines. Um, uh, but now, news agents don't exist anymore. They've either turned into um, uh, stationery companies mm -hmm. um, and gift companies, or they've they've just gone. Because the, there isn't the same uh, requirement for printed material anymore, and unfortunately, that's really a, a, a actively affected comics. Comics retreated into comic shops, uh, but they do do kids' magazines and reprints. Uh, Panini mm -hmm. do reprints of Marvel stuff, for instance, uh, but that all goes out to supermarkets. Yeah. So a lot of the time, they have poly bags and toys on the front, or gifts, mm -hmm. or. Whatever. Um, and uh, if you can't entice people into that, then uh, unfortunately they don't pick up the magazine. But um, there's it's quite a there's quite a lot of magazines on the shelf, so it's uh, it's it's a very difficult market. Yeah, well, I mean that's the whole reason why I'm on YouTube is because in order to capture the interest of new readers, uh, we can not. <laughs> Look to the past, like so many in you know corporate comics seem to think that they can do is just keep doing it the way we've always done it. Eh, we'll try digital comics, maybe. We'll we'll uh, we'll we'll maybe get a YouTube channel going, but then we'll put cooking shows on that YouTube channel. <laughs> I mean, just ridiculous. So uh, the whole reason why. I started this channel uh, was because, or even got involved with YouTube at all, is because I saw which way, you know, th the times had changed in that so many kids were online uh, when we weren't because there was no online to be when you and I were growing up. No, no, no um, exactly. You know, there was no, I mean, there were video games uh, in the late 70s and all throughout the 80s um you know um video arcades were yeah i mean vi video video arcades were booming uh, video games at home were pretty awful and <laughs> it wasn't until nintendo came out with the nes yeah. nintendo entertainment system and i believe 1985 maybe 87 mm, around uh, there yeah. yeah yeah someone in the chat will, will i'm sure have the the year on that but yeah that was the first game system and i i mean i started on pong i was playing pong on a black and white tv uh on an atari 2600 i think it was oh right we had a we had a but my brother had a binatone or binatone mm -hmm. that had uh that was just like you had these paddles and you, you just played the pong thing i think yeah it, it might have had breakout as well on there um and then uh my my friend had a 2600 i didn't have a video games machine and yeah, I didn't either. Uh, Nineteen ninety. So <laughs> we we were um, we were suburban poor. Uh, mm. The only reason we lived in the suburbs was because uh, a uh, a family member owned the house that we were living in, and then uh, ah. 
they allowed my parents to buy it off of them very affordably. Um, so we lived in, in a nice, you know, middle-class neighborhood, but you know, we were, we were po. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we lived in the sticks. We lived out in the sticks. We didn't have any money. Um, mm. no, I, I remember the lights going off on multiple occasions. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you know, I didn't for, have a video games machine when I was a kid. <laughs> so for kids like us who didn't grow up with a video game console in our own bedroom and, uh, video games on our phone that we carry around with us wherever we go. You know, when we wanted to escape um, mm. the real world uh, and let our imaginations run wild, it was comics or comics, it was cartoons, cartoons, Star or it was Star it was, Trek on a Monday night. It was <laughs> books. It, it might, be, but see, and at the time, and I promise you guys in the chat, this is all going somewhere. I'm not just rambling down a rabbit trail. <laughs> This all does have a point, believe it or not. Um, at the time, though, Russ, television was appointment viewing. Mm. You know, you had to know when a show was going to be broadcast mm. and then be there when it happened or else you missed it. Yeah, I mean, and, I missed half of uh, the Six Million Dollar Man because the uh, it was on at the same time as Top of the Pops. Mm. And we only had one TV, obviously. Yep. <laughs> and uh, my sister got to watch Top of the Pops on one Thursday night, and mm -hmm. the next Thursday night I got to watch Six Million Dollar Man. And that's the way it. That's the way it used to be, kids. That's that's <laughs> the way it was, unless uh, you could afford a VCR, which came out in the eighties, uh, invented in the late seventies, but became popular in the eighties. But they were really expensive. Um. So. Anyway, the point is that if you wanted entertainment that you could access basically 24-7, for a kid, a comic mm. book was often the answer. Uh, you could roll it up, stick it in your back pocket. You could walk with it. You could ride your bike with it. You, so you, you could go wh wherever you had the freedom to go to as a kid uh, and then break out your comic and read it. Or you could have them stashed in your room you know, whatever, but like that was the quote unquote affordable, disposable, yet captivating yeah. entertainment um, when we were growing up. Now, I promised all this had a point. Today, for kids growing up, um, I know, Russ, you've got kids, yours are older than mine, um, but the internet's been around long enough that, you mm -hmm. know, if your kids grew up with the internet. Um, and so essentially there's escapist disposable entertainment uh quote unquote cheap you know if your parents are paying for the internet access or and your parents are yeah. paying for the devices that it's broadcast yeah. on yeah. then you've got all this quote unquote free content you don't yeah. have to pay for it and if you're a kid um and you've got easy access to videos and video games um and ebooks and you know you name it it's all there um what reason do you have to pick up a comic uh well i i and a lot of other people a few years ago uh realized that you know maybe the way to reach kids to try to convince them to try comics or to reach adults that had never read a comic to convince them to try it or try and reach the people who used to read comics uh, and maybe did for years, but then walked away from it for whatever reason. Uh, for myself, I, I was forced to walk away from it because life took me to another state where I was trying to get an education. I had no money. So uh, I had no comic, no access to a comic shop, number one, no money to spend <laughs> on comics, number two. So that broke the habit for me. And I was out of it for a long time until I came back to it because I had disposable income and because I was thinking about getting into writing. This was in the 2000s. And uh, and quite frankly, uh, so some of the superhero movies that had come out, uh, some I thought were good, some I thought were bad, but that kind of reignited the interest uh, in comics themselves. And I started um, buying again. Um so the, the point to that is that it was another, it was in another medium. It was superheroes in another mm. medium. It was films. It was TV. 
that brought me back to comics. Well, now, many years after that, uh, it's the internet. It's YouTube. It's um, that is what is reaching uh, more people than TV, than um, film, especially after the last couple of years uh, with people being locked out of movie theaters. Uh, so much of it is just online uh, video based entertainment. And uh, Adam Miller says yeah, uh, basically the same thing. These days, more than ever, comics are competing with games, movies, streaming, Twitter, etc. People have more options than time when it comes to entertainment. Yes. They have more options than time, and they have instant access. And so um, the whole point for me in getting on YouTube was to try to essentially meet people uh, who were trying to do the same sort of thing I was doing, which was create comics, um, but to do it online, to try and get people's interest because people are online. And hopefully we can get their interest and steer them toward our comics and, and convince them that they're worth uh, trying out. So <clears throat> all that to say, back to Garcia Lopez and the style guide. It helped develop the house style for DC Comics. For a generation, essentially. I mean, it, it that that ten year window that doesn't equate to what a sociologist would say is a generation for, uh, you know, human civilization. But the ten years that's an era in comic book history. Uh, you know, obviously we tend to measure it sixties, seventies, eighties, uh, or we say golden age, silver age, bronze age, but usually. Um, those eras in comics are between 10 and 15 years. And um, I don't think of the style guides that have come since 1982. Uh, hey, Infinity is here. Welcome, Ollie. Uh, since the style, the style guide that was published in 82, there have been other style guides published. Um, I'm going to show something here. Uh, from an updated uh, DC style guide. Now, this one was published in 1991 uh, internally within DC Comics. Who did they get to work on it? Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. <laughs> now, you see, obviously, Superman is drawn with a much different style uh, here. Oh, I was afraid of that. Not, not, uh, not at home. Um, yeah, I can't really zoom in any closer. Sorry about that. So different drawing style, but um, the line work is still top notch. Um, all of the basics of the character are in place. Instantly recognizable, right? Then 2011. Here's a shot from DC's 2011 style guide. Who worked on it? Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. Look how his style has changed. Yeah. How it's developed. That's fantastic. It's got, it's got a little bit of Neil Adams to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yet it's still inked by Brett Breeding, by the way. And yet it's still instantly recognizable. Uh -huh. And so <clears throat> when it came to the outliers, I wanted to um, establish a house style right off the bat. I wanted to have a visual consistency that was very clear uh, and hopefully would make an impact and would be something that however many books we can do into the future, uh, there would be a, a visual standard set. And if any other artists were to work on the franchise, then I would have a style guide um, that I would show them. And I would say, you know, essentially, you know, I don't want you to try and ape Russ's style, but this is the influence that needs to be mm. kind of guiding you as you uh, are doing the work. And 
um, it's essentially an echo of the one of the things I told you, Russ, in the very early days when we were uh, talking about pre-production, where I said, you know, my my dream artist for the outliers would be a combination of George Perez, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, <laughs> Neil Adams, John Buscema, <laughs> John Byrne. Just just put those five in a blender for me and then yeah, you know yeah. have them draw, you know, my my uh superhero universe. No, no nothing too lofty then. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so uh Excuse me. Let's just zap this bot right here. And mm. uh, 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 okay, recorded. Um. So essentially, what I what I said to Russ was, you know, I. I want to hire you because I really like your style. Uh, the inspiration that I'd like you to think of as we're coming up with, you know, the looks for these characters and the visual aesthetics of the universe, I'd like you to think of Perez, Lopez, Byrne, Adams, Busema. Um, and... You know, fortunately, Russ was able to take, uh, and I think I gave you a few specific examples of why mm, those mm. artists in particular. And then, um, and then I said, you know, I'm never going to ask you to uh, try and be a clone of another artist. You know, I, I definitely want, you know, Russ Leach. I want yeah. your style on the book. But if if your style is influenced by them, those artists specifically, um, then the combination is something that. I'd be, yeah, know, I mean that was a, that was a stroke of luck because it probably was the case. <laughs> 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 there's, there's a there's a there's a, a bit of colon in there, I suppose, and um, uh, and and I do. I mean, there are a couple of other artists that you would never associate with my work that I particularly enjoy the art of, and that would be Brian Bolland. Oh, and yeah. uh, and Jim Lee, and mm -hmm. my my work is nothing like those guys, um, but th there's just there's aspects of the way that they produce their work that goes into the way that I approach my work. Yeah, um, I would say the look and feel is is definitely more, you know, eighties inspired and um, and does have a lot of those those five. Uh, legends to, to 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 work upon and obviously nowhere near what they are but but just to have them as a benchmark means that you you know you set your own your own goals a lot yeah. higher so well and to your point about you know the the 80s 70s and 80s style art you know still had an appeal to all ages i, mm. I think in the 90s when a lot of the visual aesthetics changed pretty drastically uh, a lot of people who had been comic readers up to that point walked away yeah because yeah. they're like oh yeah. i don't recognize these characters or or these books anymore i'm, I'm out uh I'll, I'll be happy with my back issues thank you very much mm. um but at the same time there was a huge influx of new readers that yeah. you know exaggerated bombastic uh visual aesthetic of the 90s extreme you know, all over the place <laughs> that Gnarly. brought in a whole lot of new readers. Um, yeah. And there yeah. were still a lot of longtime readers who, you know, did not leave. They, um, they stuck around and, um, and they enjoyed what, um, what was being offered uh, despite the change in, um, Individuals, sorry, had to take care of another bot. Yeah, yeah, I saw that one. Yeah. Um, Must be so doing anyway, something right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, these are not the droids you're looking for. Um, <laughs> anyway, so anyway, back to um, me wanting to establish a style guide for the outliers. And so the first thing we did was we 
uh, we did turn we did character turnarounds and uh, we worked out um, you know all of the looks uh, on some of these characters I had very specific um, guidelines um, uh, on the saint in particular uh, I was very had very specific reasons for why I wanted his costume to look a certain way um, his 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 build his facial features you know I gave you a lot of uh, a lot of guidelines to work with but then I said you know essentially i want to see what you come up with and then i'll roll with that because what you came up with was not um exactly what i had in my imagination because it would be impossible for you mm. to see exactly what that was right you exactly, had to go yeah, with yeah. what i uh, conveyed to you and then come up come up with something and then we went back and forth on it and um and i'm i'm very happy with the, the final result um and then that was the template for doing the rest of the turnarounds. And we, mm. we built up, we built it from there. And then when we got all the turnarounds done, we, we started building um, the visual uh, landscape of the story itself. And we've just, and when you, if for anybody who backs the book, um, you know, you'll get in chapter one, you'll get a, a self-contained 24 page story. Uh, much like a single issue of a comic back in the day. And um, it has a, a beginning, middle, and end. It basically introduces the team. You get to see how their powers work, how uh, some of their some of their personalities. Um, and then that story ends. But then in chapter two, we pick up a month later. And then we see the team again. And now we get a little more of their personalities. And we get to see them... Um, use their power etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're just we're building you know we're, we're starting with the foundation and then we're just building on that foundation and each chapter um of these books will build on what came before even though each chapter has a self-contained story so um it, it, it's i wish that the corporate publishers still cared about continuity i wish they still cared about retaining longtime readers as they try to chase new readers uh, but because they don't um there's a bunch of us russ and myself included who decided to um create new characters new stories new worlds that do have continuity that people can get invested in and feel confident that it's not all going to get dumped and rebooted in a year. Um, uh, looks like we've got uh, NTM Comics in the house. Welcome, Noah and Muttman. Uh, welcome. Glad you guys could join us. Um, so anyway, what I was saying about the... Um, where's the comment from Adam? Mm. He says, Adam Miller says, I was one of the new 90s readers. As a kid, I didn't like anything from the 80s and before. That's changed since then, of course. Well, I, my my journey, like it, much like you, I, I was out of comics for quite some time. Mm -hmm. That was after I'd, um, I'd had my brush with Marvel in around 94, 95. Yeah. And I had to, I had to go off and, and have a life. Uh, I had to make money, pay the mortgage, bring up mm -hmm. my kids, that kind of thing. So, yeah. um, off I went and did that. And, and after that, um, I, I kind of walked away from comics. So, so during the eighties, obviously I'd grown up seventies and eighties with comics into the nineties was very excited about all the new styles, the band, but the bombastic approach, mm -hmm. all these new things. Uh, then all the dark stuff came out. And of course, you know, I've got young man angst, so I'm really into killing joke and I'm really yeah. into the watchman and all the rest of it not appreciating what I'd left behind. Mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, not that anybody, any of us could have seen it coming specifically, but not realizing the way that comics had gone from uh, high street uh, shops into just into comic shops. Again, this isn't an attack on comic shops. I love comic shops. I'm a nerd. I love going to them. But you need more comics in front of people in order to bring along the next generation of readers. Yeah. So as I was leaving comics, um, so the comics were leaving the, the high street. 
they would they and they were just going into comic shops from then on and the, mm. i remember the last few comics i got at that era of time was from um the big one in town i can't remember the name of the place there was a there was a, a massive place in london um very famous i can never remember it the crap at names everyone knows that and that was where i was getting my comics from mm -hmm. and and then that was it i kind of stopped um and ignored comics and it's much like when i was younger i used to play rugby a lot uh, i was i was playing rugby up until i was about 20 mm -hmm. and um i i couldn't watch rugby for 15 years on the television oh, because okay. i loved playing the game so much yeah and couldn't play anymore and the idea of watching it i just didn't want to know yeah and to a degree that was what it was like for comics i couldn't be in that world Mm -hmm. I loved comics so much. I wanted to draw comics so much. And yet I felt I I just couldn't get that. I, you know, I'd, I'd got a, a positive response from Marvel, but it went nowhere. Yeah. I felt like, well, what was I going to, what was I going to do? So I, I, I found it difficult to even go and pick up new comics. And, and it stayed like that until I did, and, until I'd gotten over myself mm -hmm. um, and uh, also matured quite a lot. And then when I decided to change my career after I'd done other things, uh, what, 12 years ago now, um, I started buying comics again, if nothing else, just to go and find out what was going on. Yeah. Uh, and and to, to, to go and do that thing again. And that's when I had my epiphany. That's when I, I realized, do you know what? I love this stuff from the 90s. It is. It's great. Mm -hmm. But what I really love is this stuff that had inspired me when I was a child. Yeah, it's this stuff that I was reading when I was fifteen. This is the stuff that's really, really what comics is about. Um, and so I had a, I, I had quite a, quite a journey along those lines. So I, I totally understand. I mean, obviously, Adam is coming at it from a much younger perspective, I would imagine, and coming into the nineties without ever really being interested in what had come before that, but mm -hmm. still coming to a, a realization about how great those comics were how great the comics in our past were uh, well, and that's, what an inspiration they are. Yeah. I, I mean, it's one of Adam's comment reminds me that, you know, even though the different eras of comic book history do look dated, once you get far enough away from them, mm. once that's just from a strictly uh, visual perspective. Uh, mm. Once you get into the book, and you start reading again, you can be immersed right back into it. Yep. And even though some of the language might be dated or, um, you know, like fashion, et cetera, you know, you read a book from the seventies and people look like they're wearing clothes from the seventies. Uh, but for me, it only takes a page or two and I'm right back in there. It's not like I'm reliving the seventies, no. but it's, no. I'm just in this timeless comic book Age, That's right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I can get that from uh, comics in the 70s and 80s. Uh, some of the stuff in the 90s, I can. Um, but I find that a lot of the stuff from the 90s hasn't, personally, I don't think it's aged as well. A lot has not aged well, no. No, I be agree. Because it was so bombastic, because it was yeah. so, I mean, obviously, there's some fantastic stuff from that era. I'm I'm not a, I'm not a person who hates any particular era. I love it all, um, but I would say uh, I would say that proportionately, there's more from the '90s that hasn't aged as well. Well, um, I think for I lots think of different reasons. I think there was a real dichotomy in the '90s between stuff that was trying to capitalize on a trend, mm. stuff that was essentially gimmick in comic book form, versus yeah. comic book storytelling. And versus the stuff that was setting the trends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like Jim Lee set a trend and there were lots of people that, that, that ran off as clones. Uh, I, I tried it, you know, I couldn't. Um, and it, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those clones just, they just didn't work. They just didn't mm -hmm. work. And it didn't matter how much of the styling you tried to put in, you, you would be, you would never be Jim Lee. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I was really important to me that the outliers have the feel, the same type of feel that I get when I read, you know, reprints of comics from the Bronze Age, hmm. reprints of 70s, 80s stuff where, um, you know, if, I, yes, if I look at the cover of, um, 
uh, of a comic from back then, it looks like it's from the 70s or the 80s. Fair mm. enough. But as soon as I start reading it, I'm in like this timeless yeah. space of escapist entertainment. Yeah. And um, Pedro said, it's like watching an old movie. I enjoy the Maltese yeah. Falcon to this I, day. I tell you what, I've just bought myself something actually, but I, what really does it, and although this isn't a comic, it, it is still relevant because it's animation. Batman, the animated series. Mm hmm is timeless yeah i agree uh they they you know bruce tim has a certain way of doing things anyway but there was this sort of uh it it, it spanned the whole century as far as the way it looked they purposely um, styles, made it look timeless yeah, yeah. exactly they're, they're like old cars but there's mobile yep. phones there's yep. all this amazing technology but there, there's black and white tvs mm -hmm. and and just uh lots of uh, art deco and it's just amazing. And you can watch, you can go back and sit and watch that right now. Yeah. Kids could watch that right now and it'd be completely fresh. Yeah. And and I'm it at, would be relevant to them. Yeah. I I uh I agree hundred percent. I it's funny you mentioned that because I was recently thinking about getting that set um for I, my kids. I, yeah, I, yeah, I just bought it for myself because it was my birthday. Yeah. And um I thought, yeah, I'm going to have that. Well, and so that's why, you know, the whole thing with the Outliers uh, visual aesthetic, our house style, if you will, is taking elements from the 70s and 80s, but then incorporating modern drawing uh, techniques, modern production technology. Um, you know, your uh, approach with your line work, it's definitely designed to evoke a particular... Mm feeling uh i'll yeah. say i don't want to say i want it to it's not supposed to put you back in the 1980s it's no. supposed to put the reader back into that frame of mind where if you were reading comics in the 80s or in the 90s or in the 70s where you opened it up and you just got lost in it and for however long it took you to read that book you were in that world and nothing else mattered that's the I type of Thing I think we want to try and do with the outliers. Yeah, I think that's why I like I love that artwork so much from that that time is because it's so straightforward. Yeah, v visually it's easy for you to to latch onto it, and mm -hmm. it's not confusing visually either. It's 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 not like Bruce Tim Batman uh, simple because obviously he made it that simple in order right. to help the, with the animation process, but it is simple enough that it doesn't confuse the eye. It gives you everything you need in yeah, order if you to look, enjoy the story. If you look at this page, you don't have to read the words to understand what's going on. You see that the saint has just knocked this guy into next Tuesday. And his momentum has carried him down. He's hit the ground. The night falcon over here is nearby, sees it. High T here is walking towards them, and you can see that Night Falcon is trying to stomp this guy who's on the ground. Um, it, you don't need a whole bunch of dialogue to understand that that's what's happening in the story at that moment. If we go to the next page that I showed last week, this is the one we ended on. Um, I'm going to show you guys a new one here in just a minute. Here we see that you know the Night, Night Falcon is getting the tables turned on him, and then High T sees, oh, this, you know, it looks like it's time to uh, put an end to this little tussle. So he transforms. But then our werebear is, you know, got a little something in store for him. So he's get, starting to get bigger. His shirt is straining. Now it's ripping in the next panel. Oh, what's this? Looks like he's getting a little, uh, a little fur coat going here. Then we've got a little uh, homage. Anybody who watched uh, superhero TV in the late 70s, early 80s, you might understand what this is a tribute to. Uh, and then, bam! You know, Werebear fully transformed. And High T is suddenly wondering if maybe he's got himself in over his head. Maybe there's a little more here than he can handle on his own. Um, and this this whole first chapter of volume one is about um, a few of the team members uh, trying to 
handle the situation on their own instead of being a team member and, and working with their, the rest of their team. Um, you know, so stuff like this, you know, these, these impact lines here, uh, I would argue that if I were to pick up a bunch of Bronze Age comics and look for this stuff, I wouldn't find it looking like this. The, the concept is there. They use this type of thing, but not in this way. This, I would argue, is uh, from a much more modern um, time period. But we're purposely blending um, stuff from the Bronze Age with uh, more recent comic book art because we want everybody uh, to feel like this book is for them, that this book is timeless. The, the coloring, um, you know, we basically are going with flats and then a little bit more. So we're using, you know, Matt Yaki is a, a top-notch colorist, and he and I worked out a, a coloring style that blends the old and the new. Um, this stuff, I'm, this, this book is going to look fantastic on premium paper. Uh, and I yet, can't wait to get a copy of it. <laughs> I can't wait to send it to you. Um, Matt is uh, basically halfway done coloring the book. He's finished coloring chapter one. And uh, we are trying to get together to discuss uh, color tests for uh, the new characters that get introduced in chapter two. And once we get all the color tests uh, worked out, then he'll start coloring chapter two. Uh, and if you guys uh, are liking what you see in chapter one, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> That's all I'll say about that. So uh, I got to wrap up the show. I realize I'm a little bit over time uh, and Lady Fulton needs to uh, get back in here and get to work on some stuff. Uh, so I am going to uh, wrap this up. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate your time very much. And I hope that as you uh, go forward to the rest of your day, that you make it a good one. Indeed. Uh, lots of uh, lots of stuff going on that's admittedly not very fun, but I still think that we can try to make the make the most of it. So with that, thank you all, and we'll see you.